It's a dim and dreary afternoon in late September and I'm doing my best to skim stones across the water. Don't worry, it's a quiet spot and there are certainly no ducks to startle. I've picked the flattest stones I can find, but it's an art I've never quite been able to master. The objective, of course, is to see how many times the stone can bounce across the surface of the water before sinking. It's called different things in different cultures, from the Japanese water cutting to a new favourite I just discovered, leading the bride. Beliefs differ. Some say it's good luck, and the greater number of skims, the more luck you'll have, while others say that throwing stones into water is bad luck. I certainly hope it's not the latter, but I haven't had much luck yet. I haven't managed more than a single bounce of the stone. Martin's doing a lot better, so perhaps his luck will be super abundant after this. For me, it feels like an activity for slowing down and thinking about balance. Feeling the weight of the stones in my hands and considering the angle to toss them while surrounded by the sounds and smells of nature is a lovely way to restore tranquility. Some dream theory, however, talks about dreaming of throwing stones at the water as an indication of insecurity or doubt. It's interesting that such a simple nostalgic pastime can have such polarised meanings. Today's story does feature the skimming of stones, but it's not so much about things sinking to the depths as rising out of them. So cast your stones across the water, then gather close around the fire and listen in. Welcome to the Three Ravens podcast. There were three ravens sat on a tree, down a down, hey down a down. They were as black as they might be with a down. One of them said to his mate, Where shall we our breakfast take? With a down, dairy, 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 down, down. Hello and welcome to episode 25 of the Three Ravens podcast. I'm Eleanor Conlon and I'm standing on top of a long sandstone escarpment and wondering if a lost king sleeps below. And I'm joined as ever by my co-host Martin Vaux. Hello Eleanor. Is it me or does it sound like there's someone snoring round here? <laughs> now we had been enjoying some gorgeous late summer sun, but now it seems as though the autumn rains have well and truly arrived. Martin and I have definitely begun the process of snuggling. <laughs> New cardigans and extra soft furnishings have arrived, logs have been stacked and cups of hot chocolate have been consumed. And I could not be more delighted about this development. I've been excited about autumn for ages. <laughs> There's always something wonderful about the change of the seasons, isn't there? Yeah. Bit of a change of pace, moving from outdoors to indoors and of course celebrating the autumn equinox, which is one of my favourite. Yes, we did enjoy the Feast of Mabon. And if you subscribe to our Patreon, then there's, of course, the special Mega Mabon Autumn Equinox special uh, with its own story up there for you to enjoy. Speaking of Patreon, we have some wonderful new people to thank this week. Angela, Emma, Rebecca, Ian, John and Libby. Thank you so much for joining our conspiracy of ravens. All hail Angela, King of Patreon. All hail Emma, King of Patreon. All hail Rebecca, King of Patreon. All hail Ian, King of Patreon. All hail John, King of Patreon. All hail Libby, King of Patreon. If you would like to listen to the Mega Mabon special and loads of other Patreon exclusives too, please consider signing up at patreon.com forward slash Three Ravens podcast. Not least the new episode of the Three Ravens Film Club, which will be all about the 1981 folk horror classic An American Werewolf in London. Also, the end of series two is now visible just over the lip of the horizon, meaning it's now time to be sending through your own glittering gemstones of folklore and your entries to our second ever a card design contest to three ravens podcast at gmail.com in terms of folklore do send us anything weird and interesting from your local area mm. could be a ghost story a strange creature an interesting place or a bit of cunning knowledge or folk medicine Ooh, yes, please. and we'll be including those in our second ever listener episode and as for the card contest 
we're looking for original designs on the theme of the folklore of winter. Yes, so we're looking for original art from people of all skill levels sent to us as a JPEG on the theme of winter folklore. And we'll be judging those entries, picking our favourite three and turning them into greetings cards to sell for a 50-50 profit share with the winners via our shop at 3 Ravens Podcast. Com. Speaking of which, there's the cards from the first contest for sale in the shop, as well as t-shirts and mugs and other Three Ravens goodies. More coming soon, but do please flap on over to threeravenspodcast.com and check them out. Yes, please do. And in terms of the card contest, uh, we're going to close submissions on Monday the 9th of October. So be sure to have drawn or painted or made something and sent us a picture of it by then. The 9th of October, it's worth saying, is also going to be the launch of our first ever Three Ravens haunting season, oh, yeah. which we're both pretty darn excited about. Now, we haven't really said much about it, but we're planning a month of suitably spooky content, including special episodes of Magic and Medicines, The Three Ravens Bestiary, Dying Arts and Something Wicked in the lead up to Halloween, as well as original ghost stories from us each week in place of our normal Monday episodes and a new ghost walk for our supporters on Patreon, which we've been hard at work on. And then on Halloween itself, we'll be releasing a Three Ravens Halloween special all about Halloween and Samhain, traditions and folklore, and we're both really excited about that. Yes, we're also going to be inviting photos of your carved pumpkins across October. Oh, yes! This is a little thing we thought would be fun, but basically we're going to have a new Haunting Season 3 Ravens logo designed by the ever-brilliant Ollie James Dare, and we're going to give away three limited edition Three Ravens Haunting Season mugs to the listeners who send through our three favourite carved pumpkin designs to threeravenspodcast at gmail.com. We'll share all the photos we receive on our Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, provided they aren't too rude, with the hashtag (laughs) Three Ravens Haunting Season. And I think the whole thing could be a super cool celebration of crafting and Halloween across the month. Yes, indeed. But of course, more of that when Haunting Season begins in earnest with our Haunting Season Magic and Medicines episode on the 5th of October. Oh, I can't wait. I'm so excited. As for the here and now, we're releasing this episode on Monday, the 25th of September, which is Old Holy Rood Day. Holy Rood? Does this mean this is a day where monks said insulting things to bishops? Not wholly rude day. <laughs> rude as in R-O-O-D, uh, okay. which refers to the true cross. Uh, right, right, right. <laughs> we might also call it rude mass, which I like a lot. <laughs> OK, so what do we do on Old Holy Rude Day or Rude Mass, which is an excellent name? By the well, way. nothing these days, as New Holy Rude Day is celebrated on the 14th of September, uh, okay. so we've missed it. Right. But it used to be celebrated on the 25th of September before the calendar changed. Oh, I see. And it commemorates St. Helena finding the true cross in Jerusalem in the year 326. Wow. I mean, fair play, St. Helena, but was she sure? Because it feels like pieces of the true cross have been a key feature of the wares of various disreputable relic sellers for quite a few centuries. And um, I guess it's pretty easy to fake bits of a true cross, isn't it? Yeah, fragments of the true cross pop up even more often than the finger bones of saints. Yes, the monstrous St Peter with his 30 fingers and three skulls. (laughs) But St Helena's holy archaeological find must have had some credibility as an entire feast was devoted to it. Mm. Although it didn't actually enter the Western ecclesiastical calendar until the 7th century when Emperor Heraclius recovered the cross from the Persians. Mm. It subsequently became a favourite story and the subject of many romances. Okay, listener, you can't hear me stroking my beard with scepticism, but still, let's say this is true. How do we celebrate? Do we go digging somewhere? Well, I think that some of the things we've unearthed in our garden over time would definitely not qualify as holy. (laughs) Maybe the other thing. (laughs) Rude Mass was just celebrated in the usual way with masses, feasting and occasionally a fair. Mm. But I do want to talk a bit about St. Helena for a moment because she is a saint who we British have managed to claim as our own. Oh, we're quite good at this, aren't we? Especially if she was involved in some archaeology, like an Indiana Jones of uh, sainthood. (laughs) Yeah. So she was actually the wife of Emperor Constantius. And though born in what's now modern day Turkey, the pair travelled to Britain and Constantius died in York while leading the war against the Picts. Okay. So somewhere along the line, 
Tyne, it became common belief that Helena was British and it was firmly bandied about that she was actually the daughter of nursery rhyme character Old King Cole. Sorry, what? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently we, we preferred our heroes and heroines to have a local connection in the medieval age of chivalry, uh -huh. which would explain St. George. <laughs> but uh, when Helena's son Constantine became emperor, he gave her unlimited funding to locate Christian relics. Oh, unlimited funding. So in addition to the True Cross, she managed to find the site of Christ's birth in Bethlehem, <laughs> the Mount of Olives, Christ's tomb in Jerusalem, and even the remains of the burning bush in Egypt. Oh, well, I can just imagine her riding a camel, wearing a pith helmet, consulting it's a good story. It's a good story, but at the same time, if you've been paid an enormous amount of money by the church, you are going to find some relics, aren't you? I think you probably are. And then let's flip that round the other way. If you're the church and you've paid a lot for relics to be found, you're, you're going to be really happy when somebody comes forward and goes, see, burning bush, found it. you would be like, oh, yes, it is the burning bush. <laughs> now, uh, I'm going to need a receipt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, could you write an evaluation for the funds you've received, yeah. Helena? <laughs> I can see why medieval writers liked it though yeah so happy rude mess to saint helena and of course to all the archaeologists out there who may not enjoy the munificence of the emperor's unlimited <laughs> funds <laughs> oh, good heavens what's that box of stinking shin bones doing in here it belongs to the county criers oh, for gosh. their side hustlers relic sellers <laughs> and uh, i'm gonna ask them to dispose of it and ring us into cheshire oh, Cheshire is in the northwest of England on the Welsh border. It's surrounded by Derbyshire to the east, Staffordshire and Shropshire to the south, Merseyside and Greater Manchester to the north, and the Welsh counties of Wrexham and Flintshire to the west. It also has a short stretch of coastline on the Dee estuary. Previously, my only association with Cheshire was its local cheese, a delicious, crumbly, salty delight, which is perfect smushed onto a cracker. <laughs> but... A bit of research made me realise I'd heard of a number of places in Cheshire and in classic style hadn't realised they were in Cheshire at all. Now, I feel like this is developing into a fairly common theme across the course of us doing this podcast. Yeah, it's very consistent. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we've been around all 39 historic counties, yes. I think somebody ought to do us a quiz to see how much our geography has <laughs> actually improved. Yeah, that's so a good So Chester, <laughs> Crewe, Warrington, Runcorn and Ellesmere Port all places I'd heard of didn't know they were in Cheshire. Okay. Those are more densely populated, but the south and east of the county are pretty rural, meaning it's a very beautiful county with landscape dominated by the Cheshire Plain. The River Dee, which is mentioned in a number of folk songs, actually, presumably because it's extremely easy to rhyme Dee, <laughs> flows through Chester and re-enters Wales. And you can see red Triassic sandstone in the ridges and bedrock of the oh, land. sounds gorgeous. It really is. Looking at landscape photographs of Cheshire took my breath away and had me desperate to hop onto a train and get up there to explore. Mm. And train would certainly be the right method of travel. Oh, really? As Crewe was once the centre of the British railway industry. Really? Yeah, the railway works there were built in 1840 and it's one of the most historically significant railways in the world. Now, I've got to say, one of the things I associate with Cheshire is the enigmatic figure of the Cheshire Cat in the Lewis Carroll stories, particularly Alice in Wonderland. Does it actually have a name that's anything to do with the county, or is it just a pleasingly alliterative name from Lewis Carroll? Well, Lewis Carroll was born in Cheshire, in Daresbury, but the legend of the Cheshire Cat predates the Alice books. Oh. There's a 16th century carving of a grinning cat on the church tower at Grappenhall, which may have inspired him, but the phrase grinning like a Cheshire cat pops up a few times, actually. It's in the 18th century classical dictionary of the vulgar tongue and in a few novels as well. Really? Yeah, including Vanity Fair. Mm. Um, there are lots of theories about the origin, but it seems to have come from the fact that Cheshire is rich in dairy farms. Oh, I see. So the cats grin because of all the milk and the cream. Yeah, I get you. And it could also have something to do with the lion rompant, which was in the crest of many influential Cheshire families and featured on various inn signs. Possibly badly painted ones, suggesting a domestic cat rather than a lion. Okay, so is the cat or lion the symbol of the county on its flag? 
Well, the Countess emblem was historically a sheaf of golden wheat, oh, actually, really? which was used in the Earl of Chester's coat of arms from the 12th century. And the county motto is Antiqui Colant Antiquum Dierum. Cool, blimey. Yeah, that was, a, that was a bit of a tongue twister. Uh, yeah. Roughly translated as, let the ancients worship the ancient of days. Well, I mean, that is obscure. That it's, is, that it is, is isn't peculiar it? and obscure. Yes, I, I wonder <laughs> if the translation's very good yeah. and, and it's lost something along the centuries, that one. <laughs> And the name Cheshire has a couple of derivations too. Oh, really? So in the Anglo-Saxon chronicle, it appears as Lega Kestershire, meaning the Shire of the City of Legions. Ooh, Romans. Mm-hmm. But it's recorded in the Doomsday Book as Chestershire. Because of its close proximity to Wales, there's historically been a bit of border confusion there as well, resulting in some of old Cheshire becoming part of modern Flintshire. Ah. So there's also a Welsh language name for Cheshire too, Swift. Galleon. So is Saxon history the earliest we have for Cheshire? No. Ooh. I hesitate to start at the beginning, honestly, because <laughs> there is mind-blowingly ancient evidence of occupation of Cheshire. Oh, this is exciting. How ancient are we talking? We are talking between 400,000 and 380,000 years BC. That's mental. They found primitive tools dating from that period, which oh. I read... It's called the Hoxnian Interglacial. Oh, the Hoxnian Interglacial. I know, it sounds great, doesn't it? It, it also sounds like a train line, doesn't it? It does. I'm just going to hop on the Hoxnian <laughs> Interglacial and yes. make my way to Cheshire. I mean, I assume it was between various ice ages yeah, and yeah, Interglacial, but it's a funny name. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I must say, some of my recent reading has really made me want to acquire more knowledge of prehistory. Mm. I struggle to bend my mind around it sometimes. Yes, pretty amazing how much is actually known isn't it sort of speculated upon mm, from what we do have it is it's quite astounding yeah and uh, other remains have been found in cheshire from the neolithic period and in the iron age it was occupied by celtic tribes sure and we absolutely know for a fact that there were people in cheshire in the iron age because some of them are still with us today excuse me Two bog bodies, oh. Lindo Man and Lindo Woman, were discovered in a peat bog at Lindo Moss near Wilmslow. And you can meet Lindo Man because he's on display at the British Museum. Yeah, now the Lindo Man is very, very famous. I mean, those bodies are quite remarkable, aren't they? They really are very interesting. Mm. Slightly macabre. I don't know. I think the distance of ages makes it... It's it's sort of hard to say, oh, I'm looking at a glass case full of a dead body. Yeah, yeah. Because they're so old. Well, I think I'm right in saying that the Lindo man shows evidence of being murdered. Yes, that's right. So there are two different theories. They tried to do a kind of autopsy on mm -hmm. this body that was in the bog for all this time. But, I mean... He's gone all flat and weird. He's like he's melted. But yes, he's gone a bit flat, but they think he might have met a violent end. Yes, that's um, right. They always say possibly ritualistic. Yeah, they, they think it was maybe druidic, but uh, that's, again, quite speculative. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, we know a bit more as the centuries go on because the Romans got involved from 70 AD and stayed involved for the next 400 years. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Luckily, they, they saw fit to found the town of Deva Victrix, which is now, I think, slightly disappointingly known as Chester. Yeah, now, Deva Victrix is a better name than Chester, I think. Isn't <laughs> and it was a mega fortress too. Apparently 20% larger than other Britannian fortresses such as Eboracum and Caerleon. That's amazing. And some historians have even suggested that Deva Victrix was intended to be the capital of the Roman province in Ooh, Britannia. Really? Mm -hmm. wow. uh, to give you an idea of scale... The amphitheatre there could seat between 8,000 and 10,000 people. Oh, that's this big, pretty big astounding. amphitheatre. So what happened to Cheshire then after the Roman Empire? Well, there was still a bit of turbulence mm -hmm. <laughs> due to Cheshire's position on the boundaries of several of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Yes. It was between Northumbria, Mercia and the Welsh kingdoms of Powys and Gwynedd. Mm. So, of course, it ended up forming part of Mercia. Yeah. <laughs> Chester, as it then was, was significantly extended and strengthened to deal with interference from the Danes. But eventually, Alfred of Wessex managed to agree a peace treaty with the Danes in about 895. Good old Alfred of Wessex. Yeah, thank you, Alfred. And you can actually still see lots of Mercian place names throughout Cheshire today. So places with the suffix ham derived from yeah. the Saxon. Mm. So you've got Frodsham, Eastham, Weaverham, 
Uh, ham means settlement, by the way. Yeah, it's nothing yeah. to do with ham. Um, <laughs> well, bur or bury means a fortified settlement or a stronghold. And it does sound a bit like Cheshire was pretty well fortified at that point in time. Yes, and it became even more so after William the Conqueror, yeah. who uh, did the classic and built a castle there. Um, the, the castle's overlooking the River Dee, uh, which actually made Chester one of the most tanked up defensive cities in Britain. Ah, well done, Billy the Conks. <laughs> yep, and he also abolished the Earldom of Mercia and created a brand new Earldom of Chester, naming his friend Hugh d'Avranche the first Earl, and he was nicknamed Hugh Lupus, or Hugh the Wolf. Ooh, OK, well, that sounds promising. Go on, tell me. He was a werewolf, wasn't he? He was a werewolf? He's got to be a werewolf. Unknown, which I'm saying is not ruled out. <laughs> yep. But he did certainly have a wolf on his coat of arms. I'm saying he was a werewolf. <laughs> Let's go for it. Chester was founded by a werewolf. Fact. <laughs> well, and Hugh, uh, Hugh the werewolf ruled pretty much autonomously. Oh, really? Because Cheshire was declared a county palatine, which means the hereditary nobleman living there has an almost royal prerogative with the full authority of the monarch. Ooh. So it's like you saying, you know what, Eleanor? I trust you. You just run that part of the country yeah, and I yeah. won't get involved. Well, I don't know whether it's a good idea to trust things to a werewolf. I mean, they're probably fine most of the time, but obviously when the moon's full, mm. it's troublesome, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, the reports from that period have been curiously silent on the subject of Hugh's wolfy <laughs> tendencies. <laughs> if that's a band of history that somebody wants to explore, we'd be very grateful. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and subsequent to Hugh the Wolf's appointment, the Normans put up lots more castles Ooh. throughout Cheshire oh, to maintain their authority in a place where, to all reports, they were not popular. Oh, OK, so does this mean that Cheshire has lots of good castles? We, yes, it absolutely does. Oh, great. From the remains of Iron Age Hill Fort, Maiden Castle, oh, Helsby Hill Fort and Woodhouse Hill Fort to Beeston Castle, Chester Castle, Chumley Castle, Peckfort and Castle and Buddlewithen Castle. Yes, if you like castle hopping, Cheshire is probably the place for you. Well, I do like castle hopping and you suggested catching a train. Shall we go? Shall we go on a train? Shall we I go right we now? we ought. <laughs> Beeston Castle in particular sounds quite spectacular. It's a 13th century fortress, almost 500 feet above the Cheshire Whoa. Plain and it's got a 40 acre woodland park and apparently has views all the way from the Pennines to the Welsh mountains. Well, adding that to the castle barrel list immediatement. <laughs> it might also be nice to visit Dunham Massey, which is a stunning stately home, or Lime Park Mm. which is home to the Serum Missal, a beautiful printed Bible dating from 1487. Ooh, that's pretty old. Gawsworth Hall caught my attention too because of its possible connection to Shakespeare. Oh, yeah. It's this beautiful black and white Tudor hall, but I discovered that it was home to Mary Fitton, who is one of the contenders as the dark lady figure in Shakespeare's sonnets. OK, well, now this probably needs a bit of unpacking. If you're not a Shakespeare fan, don't have a clue who the dark lady is. Eleanor, very briefly, who was the dark lady? You're probably familiar without knowing you're familiar. Mm. So if you've ever heard the sonnet, My Mistress Eyes and Nothing Like the Sun, yeah, or famous. Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, these are sonnets in Shakespeare's sonnet cycle, which are dedicated to the mysterious figure of a dark lady lady or a dark eyed or dark haired lady. Mm. The much larger part of the cycle is dedicated to another figure called the Fair Youth. So the yeah. Dark Lady Sonnets form a smaller part of it. And there's been a lot of biographical speculation about who this Dark Lady might have been, yeah. trying to connect her to real figures rather than sort of allowing her to exist as an abstract muse. Sure. So the owners of uh, Goresworth Hall and its website are very keen to emphasise that Mary <laughs> Fitton was definitely the oh, dark lady. She's definitely this one. Definitely. I, of course, could not possibly comment. <laughs> Which means that she's absolutely desperate to comment, but it's thoughtfully reining it in because Three Ravens isn't a podcast just about debating the shadowy players in William Shakespeare's personal dramas. <laughs> I am being the bigger person. <laughs> To uh, <laughs> go to something else, I probably talk about far too much. Cheshire was quite interesting in the Civil War. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to uh, digress several centuries ahead and keep me from questions of authorship and identity. <laughs> and the county was a real mix of royalist and parliamentarian allegiances. Okay. And while the local gentry actually tried really hard to keep the county neutral, that they were really trying to be Switzerland yeah. in this one. And they made the fantastically named Bunbury Agreement. Ooh, is this related to Oscar Wilde? 
<laughs> well, I do. I wonder if he, that's where he got the name. Yeah, that's um, interesting. Yeah, the Bunbury Agreement was meant to keep Cheshire neutral, okay. but its strategic position was too important basically for the opposing forces to ever accept that so uh, the Bunbury agreement was regularly smashed to smithereens and there were loads of battles there and oh, Ch- no. Chester was even sieged so does this mean that Chester was also a port yeah okay. um, because of the D estuary right and it's on um, these the Wirral Peninsula part oh, of it I gotcha, yeah. Um, yeah so it was a really desirable piece of territory mm. and it became pretty important as well in the industrial revolution and not just for cheese manufacturing uh, but for silk and they've got the most amazing buildings in uh, Macclesfield where the silk mills predominantly were Uh and and though they're Victorian they incorporate this gorgeous early mock Tudor style timber work and in other buildings you can see the red sandstone which is notable in the county many are timbered although from the 18th century brick was predominantly used so the local architecture is pretty amazing look at pictures of cheshire everywhere it's beautiful so while we do love a spot of architecture on three ravens i've got to confess i'm champing at the bit i want to know about cheshire's folklore well this is still technically architecture (laughs) but the mystery attached is a little folkloric on the top at carriage hill at bollington there is a strange dome-like folly called White Nancy. White Nancy? Mm -hmm. Which was built in 1817. It is hollow and it has some stone benches and a table, but the door is sealed off and nobody knows why it's called White Nancy. Oh, that's really mysterious. I mean, if anyone has any curious facts about White Nancy or a way to inform us further, I'm deeply intrigued. White Nancy, a strange big dome with some stuff in it. It's, nobody um, knows what it's, it's for. It's quite amusingly shaped. I, I oh, put a picture on the blog. I see, OK. <laughs> yes, we'd love to know about that. So if you know anything more, get in touch. Cool. All right, let's get stuck into the folklore proper then. Mm. For starters, we have got the Dragon of Moston. Ooh. Oh, nice, a dragon. Yeah, this this poor dragon was killed by Sir Thomas Venables in 1535 cool. and was said to be the last dragon in England. Oh, magnificent. Yeah, I can't believe that for a moment. <laughs> I'm sure there are still some around somewhere. Yeah. It's commemorated today by a lane named Dragon's Lane, which is where Thomas supposedly saw it off. Well, maybe the dragon survived and Sir Thomas just came to a Bunbury agreement. <laughs> With, so with this worm. I hope so, because I can't possibly condone the idea that there haven't been dragons here since 1535. Yeah. Seems completely implausible. Unacceptable, yes. <laughs> they actually seem to have a bit of a track record for slaying the last thing in Cheshire. Oh, okay. Because they're also responsible for the demise of the Black Wolf of Barthomley, which was described as being as big as a cow Ooh. and was apparently the last wolf killed in England. <laughs> uh, uh, but you can still uh, hear its ghost snuffling about a nearby brook oh, where it used to really cool. run around being well, terrifying. Firstly, there's something quite adorable about the idea of a ghost wolf. Really like that. But, but maybe it's Hugh the wolf <gasps> personified as a ghost. Oh, I wonder if anyone's made this incredible academic connection before <laughs> Hugh Lupus slash the Black Wolf of Bartholomew. Yeah, connections, baby. <laughs> and it's an adorable ghost. <laughs> Perhaps a little bit less adorable is the Headless Horseman in Stockham Lane in Runcorn, who is the ghost of a Civil War cavalier. And there's another military-adjacent ghost on Cloud Hill on a stone outcrop, rather unfortunately known as Drummer's Knob. Drummer's Knob. Drummer's Knob. Okay, um, great. It's said to be haunted by the ghost of a young drummer boy, hence uh-huh. the name, who was killed by an English sniper in the Jacobite Rebellion. Oh. And he now haunts the area with his ghostly drumming. Oh, I'm always interested in ghosts. I mean, Cavaliers, great. Headless Cavaliers, better. also excellent, possibly even better. Young drummers and drumming ghosts. We've had a few of those across mm. Three Ravens tour around the counties. Loving that. As ghostly annoyances go, a phantom drummer, though, has to rank pretty highly because you presume it would summon all the other ghosts to haunting and spookiness. Oof. Yeah, I think the local council probably need to come to a bumper agreement <laughs> with them about appropriate hours for ghoulish percussion. <laughs> Now, we do love an Arthurian connection here in the Three Ravens' Nest, and Cheshire has them a plenty. Yeah, you've got to presume so, because it's on that border with Wales. Mm-hmm. Mm, yes, OK, it go is, on. Actually, Chester is a contender for the true Camelot. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, everywhere. I mean, like, that spot in our garden, that's a contender that's for the, the true, true Camelot. Camelot. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. But the Roman amphitheatre that I mentioned earlier yes. um, has been 
flat, floated as an option for the round table. Yeah, but is it as good as the Isle of Avalon being Glastonbury when it was all flooded as a marsh? No, that's compelling. <laughs> Tintagel, that's compelling. I don't know, having a big round amphitheatre. Like, no offence, Cheshire, but... <laughs> I mean, you'd certainly be able to pack in the night. Yeah, for sure. If it was a sort of 8,000 seater. But I mean, you know, when people say, oh, Arthur had 300 nights, everyone's like, wow, that's an awful lot of nights. But that was an 8,000 to 10,000 person amphitheatre. And they might have got a bit lost in there, <laughs> might <Exactly. like> they? <laughs> King Arthur, how many seats should we have around your round table? 10,000. <laughs> that just seems a and little bit... And how many friends do you have? Yeah. 300. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ambitious. Yeah, exactly. Well, I guess we can discuss once and for all how many knights he actually had okay. because uh, of course as we all know when England is in trouble King Arthur will rise again yes, yes, with true. his knights mm-hmm. and luckily we know where they're going to come from oh, because the resting place of Arthur and the knights is said to be under Alderley Edge which is the sandstone ridge overlooking the Cheshire Plain as oh. uh, so Arthur's there with his knights in the caves of Alderley Edge just some, having a peaceful nap until they're required to come to England's aid. Oh, how lovely. And uh, Sir Gawain, he of the Green Knight and the questionable extramarital affairs, yeah. proved his valour across Cheshire. Oh. And there's also a story about the wizard Merlin appearing to a Cheshire farmer. Really? <laughs> Well, yep. In the modern day? And not that modern. Oh, okay. no, not that recently, but more recently than King Arthur. Okay. Go on, tell, <laughs> so me, tell me. The farmer was off to market at Macclesfield, walking along Audley Edge, when he was stopped by an old man in flowing grey robes who yeah. tried to buy his horse. Uh-huh. The farmer refused, saying he'd get a better offer at the market. Uh, the old man then told him he would be at the same spot later that evening when the farmer returned, having failed to sell the horse. Mm-hmm. Well, it turned out as the old man said. And later he was waiting for the farmer in the same spot. And the farmer accepted his offer this time because he thought, well, I've got to sell this horse. Yeah. So the old man told the farmer to follow him with the horse to a crack in the rock, which the wizard opened by casting a spell. The farmer followed the wizard inside and saw lots of men with white horses all asleep. The wizard paid the farmer, took the horse and sent him on his way. But later conjecture says that the wizard was Merlin and the knights were the men of King Arthur sleeping until their time comes once more. Can we make a presumption as to what Merlin wanted this horse for? No. (laughs) We we cannot. But Merlin has also been connected with another ghostly apparition near Alderley Edge, which manifests itself as a naked wizard running around. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) <laughs> it's on my business card already. Naked wizard. Running around. Well, apparently this this uh, phantom was once approached by a police officer, uh-huh. presumably to ask it to put on some trousers, Ooh. whereupon it vanished into thin air. Now, if you ask me, it's about time that the Knights of the Round Table actually woke up again. If not to rescue England, then at least to give Merlin something better to do than running around <laughs> naked bothering people. Well, quite. We need you, Knights. <laughs> <laughs> Alderley Edge, though, has so many fascinating tales attached to it any walk along it is bound to turn up some folklore really? yeah there's a cave known as the devil's grave which is dubiously useful okay i'm deeply intrigued what do you mean yeah. by dubiously useful <laughs> well legend has it that if you run widdishins around the cave three times yeah the devil will be raised sure and will restore your virginity i guess to say thanks <laughs> i mean that's Quite the claim and a weird one. That's so it's very a odd. Weird thing to want to do, but yeah. I suppose it might come in useful. <laughs> M- maybe. I mean, yeah. If you're going to have to get married to some nobleman in sort of the seventeenth mm, century, you've accidentally uh, yeah. had, had an had, interesting time with the stable boy yeah, ahead indeed. of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems like an unusual thing for the devil to do, though. It does, doesn't it? Just yeah. Sort of helpful. You would have thought that you'd run around three times and then suggest to the devil some virginities he could go and take. <laughs> yes. That's more his jam. So he's so grateful for being raised from his devil's grave. He uh, he rewards me. Is, is that me. all I'm here for? Okay, all very right, well, Barbara. Yeah, we'll sort that Have out. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> well, if uh, once Barbara had done that, she could go on a further tour of the ridge, yeah. which might take her past Mad Allen's Hole. <laughs> Sorry, what Mad Allen's Hole? It's a cave, Martin. What do you think I mean? <laughs> uh, nothing. It's actually a rather fancy two-storey cave Ooh, okay. with a chimney, which was supposedly inhabited by a heartbroken hermit in the 17th century. Oh, no, Mad Allen is a tragic figure. Mm-hmm. Oh. A heartbroken who's 
so sad when uh, somebody dumped him they went and lived in a cave. Oh, poor mad Alan. I've got another amusingly tragic legend too, oh, and yeah. hailing from the Blue Bell Inn near Tushingham, okay. which is one of Cheshire's oldest pubs. Oh. And it was once plagued by a ghostly duck. What? Which was so disturbing that it had to be exercised and trapped in a bottle, then bricked up in the cellar. Oh, this is so good. I mean, every time I think we found the strangest, most charmingly eccentric tidbit of local folklore for this podcast, I get surprised by another one. A ghost duck haunting a pub that has to be <laughs> stored great. in a bottle and then cemented in the wall. And I mean, it's still oh, there. What? The ghost yes. duck is still in the wall. Well, it's just bricked up in the cellar. Oh. So it couldn't get out and, I don't know, quack at people. Okay. It's hard to imagine the, what the form the hauntings would take, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. But we've got to go to the Blue Bell Inn and see if we can hear the quacks through the yes. brickwork. Let me out, quack, quack. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to walk along Alderley Edge, though. It yeah. looks beautiful. And I, I think it's fair to say that the landscape of Cheshire generally tends to play a big part in its folklore. Uh, we were talking about the author Alan Garner earlier this week. Oh, so um, good. Yeah, famous for the Weird Stone of Brisingerman, if, you um, if you've heard of him. He lives and works at Alderley Edge. And his books are very much informed by the countryside around him. And although the books are mythic fantasy stories... They are firmly located in the Cheshire that Garner knows and loves. Mm. And luckily, there are rich pickings for him and for us as well, many of which seem to be connected to stones. I mean, Alan Garner writes lots of different folk tales, like some of them old, some of them new. So he kind of comes up with his new ones. I mean, he's a bit of a genius, Alan Garner, but I do love a stone. The Weird Stone of Brisingerman, I think, was probably one of the first proper books I read when I was a kid. Really? You know, Yeah, going, OK. These book things are pretty cool. <laughs> well, if you like stones, there are quite a lot to choose from. Oh, really? There's the Old Man of Hellsby, which is the profile of an old man's face in the sandstone outcrop of Hellsby Hill, which is said to be able to predict the weather, but only when his head's in the clouds. What? It's only when the clouds are so low that it's covered up. <laughs> <laughs> then there is Thor's Stone near First Atom, which okay. is a sandstone rock actually believed to be Thor's hammer, dropped from the sky to be among his people. Again, we've had this a few times, mm. haven't we? I mean, there was one in Oxfordshire. He's always yeah. dropping hammers. Do you reckon he had multiple? He must have. Well, I think it was sort of in places where the Danes yeah, settled. Sure. Um, there's these legends about Thor going, ah, my people are here. Let me yeah, just okay. pop a hammer down. <laughs> like popping a tack down. <laughs> and the, also the location of King Canute's chair, where he famously turned the tide back, is said to be at the tip of the Wirral Peninsula at no Mills. No way! That's so cool! Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think there's anything there to see. Sure. Just, that's apparently where it was. Oh, King Canute sat there, you know. Yes, King Canute's <laughs> invisible chair. <laughs> Cheshire also has a connection with Robin Hood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there are two mysterious stone pillars which mark the border with Derbyshire, known as Robin Hood's picking rods. <laughs> Sorry, his picking rods? Mm. That's weird. Yeah, well, theories about these range from it being an ancient druidic site to a memorial to the last stand of local warriors against the onslaught of the Roman Empire. Sure. Or, and I think this is where the name comes from, a tool for shaping longbows used by Robin Hood. Oh, OK. What's well, so it like to bend them around the Ooh, rocks or something? I, I guess so, mm, yeah. Oof, I mean, they might just be there to mark a route. Yeah. But Robin Hood was certainly said to have been a visitor to that part of Cheshire. Oh. And his faithful friend, Will Scarlet, is actually meant to be from Macclesfield. <sighs> See, I'm struggling to imagine how one shapes a longbow using a standing stone. Yes, so, I am too. <laughs> I'm hoping that one of our listeners is an expert in traditional bow making and can explain this to me. Yes, please. <laughs> Come forward, <laughs> traditional bow makers. Yes. Wow, Cheshire has been such an interesting county to explore. Albeit from my cosy chair and the pages of books and the internet, rather than <laughs> tramping about in the footsteps of Merlin, yeah, or being the naked wizard. Yeah, naked wizards, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could definitely keep going, but I should probably start telling a story soon. Yeah. I'm going to leave you with two more fun facts, though. Mm -hmm. First is about the ancient Bible chest at St. Oswald's Church in Lower Peva. 
Okay. It has three locks, mm-hmm. which means that three church officials have to be present to open it. Oh. When you see that in church chests, that yeah. means that's the number of people they want to open Sure, like them. when in movies they're setting off a nuclear bomb yep. or whatever, they need multiple <laughs> keys. Yep, yeah, exactly. But it also has a very quaint tradition attached to it. Mm-hmm. It's apparently so heavy that any local woman who wished to become a farmer's wife had to be able to lift the lid with one hand <laughs> to prove she was up to living life on a farm. She's going to have strong wrists. Oh, yeah. that's great. And quite the way to decide that marriage is right for you. Uh-huh. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Can you lift up the lid of this box? Yeah. And if Perfect. you can't, if, then, if you you just, can't then... You just whip back to that cave, run three times around it, and yeah. try to find yourself a new boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> the last treasure thing I want to talk about today is the Antropus Soul Cakers. Antropus soul cakers? What on earth are they? This is a very old tradition, which is almost upon us, Ooh. as it takes place around about Halloween, cool. when the veil between the living and the dead is at its thinnest. Mm-hmm. The time is celebrated by eating special cakes called soul cakes, and children used to go from house to house singing and asking for soul cakes, a little bit like wassailing. I see, OK. And in Cheshire in particular, this changed into the performance of mummers' plays by groups called soul cakers or soul and gangs. Oh, right. In in Antropus Village, the words used in the traditional plays were recorded and have been passed down through generations. Wow, this is They're awesome. They're still doing the traditional play. Oh, cool. And the play they do is quite unusual among Mama's dramas for its characters. Oh, yeah? It's got the Black Prince, King George, the Quack Doctor, and the star of the show is Dick the Wild Horse. <laughs> Dick the Wild Horse. Dick the Wild Horse. He's actually quite scary. His head is an actual horse's skull Ooh. with wired jaws, oh so he goodness. can snap at the audience. That's so cool. And do we know if the Antropus Soul Cakers will be performing this year? Uh, they certainly will. So if you're in the Cheshire area, consider giving the village of Antropus a visit and meeting Dick the Wild Horse. <laughs> meeting Dick the Wild Horse. Okay, I need to stop smiling. He's supposed to be a source of terror, but he just sounds I, th- I think hilarious. he's sort of fun and naughty, but also you don't know yeah. when he might snap. Yeah, okay. Keeps you guessing, Dick the Wild Horse. What a cool tradition, <laughs> love it. Now, my story today has mysterious warnings echoing from its sunken depths, and I'll start spinning my yarn right after this. It was the night before my wedding, and I felt like a background performer in somebody else's big scene. I was rapidly discovering that everybody else had very firm opinions on what a wedding ought to be and that the wishes of the actual couple were more or less irrelevant. Hazel and I would have probably preferred a quiet elopement, but with her family, that was never going to be an option. Even Hazel's hen party hadn't really been to her taste, although she was far too polite to say so. If I were being tactful, I would describe Hazel's sister as having a forceful personality. If tact was totally abandoned, I would call Amber a complete nightmare. She'd taken it upon herself to organise things Hazel and I hadn't even realised needed organising and was making herself very unpopular doing it. We had to keep reminding ourselves that we were actually looking forward to our wedding because Amber really sucked all the fun out of it. I think Hazel and I were both secretly looking forward to the honeymoon more. We'd booked a cottage and had been deliberately vague about where exactly it was, despite having lots of digs from Amber about not going on an expensive trip abroad. That evening, we were all together in Hazel's family home, a lovely old farmhouse in Cheshire, and the atmosphere had reached fever pitch. Hazel's mum was making a fuss about making her lasagna for everybody. The lasagna was always perfect, but she worried about it beyond all reasonable level. Amber was alternating between phoning the florist to scream at them every five minutes and frantically tweaking her handmade table centrepieces. Hazel had escaped upstairs, saying she wanted to check her dress and shoes, but I suspected that she had barricaded the door to her childhood bedroom and was reading a book. I certainly couldn't blame her for that. And when Amber screeched at the florist for the fourth time, I made desperate eyes at Harry, my soon-to-be brother-in-law, wordlessly begging him to get me out of there. He was a much quieter person than Amber, more like Hazel really, and he looked pretty grateful to have an excuse, 
as Amber had recently been haranguing him about napkin folding styles, a subject I was pretty sure he'd never considered in his life. Dogs, Harry said suddenly. They need walking. Want to come with me, Robin? I leapt up with almost indecent speed and had never been happier to see the mournful expressions of the two floppy-eared basset hounds. We found our wellies and the dog leads and were soon putting distance between ourselves and the pressure cooker atmosphere of the house. All gets a bit much, doesn't it? Harry said, and I readily agreed. We walked in blessed silence, inhaling the late afternoon air. It was still light just about, although the weather had been dingy grey all week, which made it seem darker earlier. I felt the tension easing from my shoulders as we walked through the beautiful countryside leading down to Rossburn Mere. It was a stunning walk and one I often enjoyed with Hazel when we were visiting her parents. We had to cross a little lane, helping the dogs over the stile, and then we were in the meadow leading down to the mere itself gorgeously clear lake surrounded by lush wetlands. Harry and I walked quietly around the edge of the mere for a while, until the dogs needed a breather and paused to investigate some ducks. Harry picked up a stone and skimmed it perfectly across the water, where it bounced four times before sinking to the bottom. That's a knack, I said, rather impressed. I've never managed to skip a stone successfully. Lots of practice, Harry said dourly, escaping from Amber when we were growing up. Has she always been like that? I asked. Oh yes, he said. Sure you want to be related to her? I'm sure about Hazel, I said, which was probably all the answer to the question he needed. Then I remarked that it was a lovely spot to change the subject. Yes, it is, I like it, he said. Then he looked at me sideways with that peculiar smile he has. Oh, if you hear bells, we better go home sharpish. Bells? I asked, unable to imagine what he meant. Hasn't Hazel told you the story about the bell? No, she's never mentioned it. Oh, probably shouldn't have said anything then, Harry said. Bit inauspicious the night before your wedding, now I come to think of it. Forget I spoke. You can't say that and then not tell me, I said. As if to back me up, one of the basset hounds promptly sat on his foot to prevent him from leaving before he told me his mysterious story. Oh well, in that case, Harry said amiably. He picked up a few stones from the water's edge and had a supply in his hand, and every so often he skimmed one into the water. The rhythmic sound was a comforting accompaniment to his voice as he spoke, and I found myself almost hypnotised by the splashes. They say that when Rosthorn Church was built in, oh, I don't know, the 1600s or something, it was almost finished, and there were only the bells left to put into the tower. It was the day before Easter Sunday, so they were keen to get it done so that the chimes could ring out to celebrate Easter. The builders were lugging the bells up the hill, but one of them kept rolling back down whenever the man pushing it took his hands off it for a moment. Well, he got more and more wound up, and after this had happened a few times, he said to the bell, I would the devil had thee! Sounds ominous, I said. Well, yes, the devil was obviously listening, Harry said seriously, as though he really believed any of this might have happened. Because as soon as he pushed the bell up the hill and was taking a breather, it rolled down towards him faster than it ought and squashed him stone dead. And it kept rolling until it fell in the mere here and sank. (laughs) Serves him right for cursing, I said, trying to inject some joviality. The afternoon was beginning to feel colder, and Harry's story was not the cheeriest. Oh, that wasn't the end of it, though, he said. The legend says that the bell fell into the mere and landed on the home of the mermaid who lives at the bottom. Mermaid? Come on now. Really? Harry said. That's the story. It fell on her home and crushed one of her eggs, just the same as it had crushed the builder. She was so angry, she blamed the people on land for casting the bell and bringing it to Rosthern. 
and being so careless as to drop it in her mirror. So the next morning at dawn, she dragged the sunken bell with her all the way up to the surface and rang it on Easter morning, singing a tragic song the whole time. The noise was so awful that the service was ruined. Apparently, she's done it every Easter morning since. If you're ever here for Easter and you're minded to get up early, you might spot her. I imagine she would feel my scepticism coming and stay well underwater, I said. You don't believe it, do you? You haven't actually heard anything, have you? I'm not an early riser, he said. And it's only meant to be at dawn on Easter Day this mermaid appears. Or when someone's going to die, said Harry. But surely she'd be appearing all the time in that case, I pointed out. It was a fanciful story, but someone dies every few minutes. Oh, it's not just anyone, he said. I think they need to be vaguely connected to the family at Tatton Hall, the Edgertons. Wouldn't ring for you, even if you were at death's door. Hasn't your family got an Edgerton connection? I said. I vaguely remembered Hazel's dad mentioning the name linked to Tatton Hall, which was the lovely National Trust property near their home. Not something very far down the line, Harry said. Probably on the wrong side of the bedsheets. But did you mean about it being bad luck the night before our wedding? I persisted. The mermaid story was a little macabre, perhaps, but it didn't feel particularly relevant. Oh, just that the mermaid was last heard of in... Oh, I don't know quite when. Victorian times, I think. She appeared to a young woman called Charlotte Edgerton. You can see a memorial in the church if you like, although I expect your mind will be on other things tomorrow. Anyway, Charlotte is supposed to have seen the mermaid on the eve of her wedding, and she was dead within an hour. What? I said, incredulous. Was that the official cause of death? Saw a mermaid and keeled over? Oh, oh no, it was apparently a bronchial infection, but, you know, people like their superstitions. I was a little bit relieved, I have to confess. I'm not superstitious, and I've never believed in ghosts or other monsters. A pre-existing bronchial condition seemed far more plausible than the sighting of a strange woman with a bell. Nevertheless, I was happier when we'd started the walk home from Ross than Mere, despite not really believing in any of it. Omens of death, though, are not something one really wants to consider before the happiest day of one's life. Harry skimmed his last stone and we took the dogs back to the cottage, where mercifully everything had calmed down. I was staying in the spare room that night, because it was supposed to be bad luck to sleep in the same bed as Hazel. I didn't really agree with that and would have rather started our married life as we intended to go through it, together, but her family insisted. I found myself unable to sleep after Harry's odd story. Although I didn't believe it, and I probably ought to be thinking about the things I needed to do in the morning, like making sure my best man had actually come to the right county, I sat up in the chair by the window, looking out over the fields towards the mere. I don't think I actually slept all night, or perhaps I only dozed in the chair, because the sky was getting light with misty wisps of dawn when I opened my eyes. I cracked the window open, hoping the cold air would wake me up a bit in lieu of coffee having been made. Then I heard a strange, hollow booming. Not, not like a church bell, really, but something darker. It sounds ridiculous to say, but... I could almost hear rust in the sound. I looked out of the window towards the mirror, and though it was only just getting light, there was a darker shape in the centre of the water. Hazel's dad is a keen bird watcher, one of those people who keeps a pair of RSPB binoculars on every windowsill in case he catches sight of a lesser spotted warbler of some sort. With a feeling rather akin to dread, I took the binoculars out of their case and raised them to my eyes. I could see what was definitely a head and shoulders above the surface of the water, and a long, thin arm holding a huge, algae-encrusted bell. 
the arm was emaciated and the skin greenish and indistinct as though it were still under water. But the eyes of the creature were the worst part. Huge green and yellow orbs curiously slanted and brimming with an expression so sad it sent a wave of emotion through me as though I too might cry at any moment. Out of its mouth came a strange high wailing sound which I could hardly call a song. The sound of it made me feel nauseous, so I put the binoculars down and backed away from the window, giving myself a little slap on the cheek to wake myself up. I was still half convinced that I was dreaming at that point, you see, so I staggered down the landing to the bathroom and splashed my face with water. When I got back to the spare room, there was no sign of the creature in the mirror. Still feeling as though I might be sick, I lay down on the bed and must have fallen asleep again because the next thing I was conscious of was Hazel leaning over me, all rumpled hair and creased pyjamas. This is all very nice, I said, but aren't I meant to not see you? Oh, never mind about that, she said. Can you come and help? It's Amber. I don't think she's very well. Well, I expect you can guess that we didn't get married that day after all, although we did stay in Rosthen for a bit to help with Amber's funeral. In the end, we had a much smaller wedding ceremony which suited us much better, and we see a lot more of Hazel's family. I find myself much more inclined to visit them now that Amber's not there. But if Harry ever asks me to accompany him to walk the dogs down to the mere, I always decline. Martin, the mermaid of Rosthern Mere. Yeah. Would you want to see her ringing her bell or would you rather not know? Well, I don't think as I'm connected to this particular family, I'd be much bothered. Um, no, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see a mermaid. And it's so cool to have another mermaid tale. It feels like it's been ages since we had one. I mean, obviously we had your Wild Man of Orford story a little while ago, the yes, end of merman. series one. And then the Mermaid of Zena, which kind of was almost the first episode. Was it the very first episode? I think it was of episode three. Episode three. And you told us about the the mermaid who wanted to marry the sailor. Yeah, that's right. And then there was, of course, um, that monster fish of Beaumere Pool. Oh, yes, the fish with the sword. That's right. Wild Edric sword, or Edric the wild sword, theoretically, that this giant fish is armed with and it's uncatchable, cuts all the nets away. It sounds like it might be a buddy of the mermaid of Ross and Mere. Well, that was from Shropshire, and Shropshire is obviously on the border of Cheshire. So it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, that you've got these mere haunting horror, horror shows, basically. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is it. I mean, normally we, we associate mermaids with pretty things nowadays, don't mm. we? They're, they're sort of been romanticised but they yeah. used to be scary well that's right? why I wanted to make a sort of scary sad one yeah. as opposed to a beautiful singing one well I think it was an excellent choice to make obviously because I like a creepy story I quite <laughs> like the idea of a mermaid singing but it being a racket yeah and so sirens obviously connected to the mermaid we talked about this I think a little bit before certainly we've had conversations about it on social media with people before but sirens terrifying creatures mm. always considered to be monsters mermaids now seen as something a bit more romantic and charming and attractive but sometimes they do presage death yeah. if you're a sailor aboard a ship and you see a mermaid in the waves that can mean your ship's going to go down no, so definitely. they do have this link with uh, bad things are coming yeah for sure and i'm very interested in this idea of transitions between um, above ground and underwater because one of the things that we do know about ancient peoples particularly what we know about druidic belief and when we think about places like flag fen you know, what happened to your bell what happened to the ring in our fish mm. in the ring story last week is this idea of water lines or the surface of the water almost being like a portal into the other world or the mm. underworld and that a lot of ceremonies used to take place where people would pass uh, important objects significant to their family significant to the royal family whatever it might be into the water and then sinking it ceremonially in that water marked its transition from being alive to being dead. Yes, and well, in Venice, every year at the carnival, the Doge of Venice symbolically marries the sea. So he'll he'll throw a valuable wedding ring into the sea every year. How interesting. Yeah, isn't that good? Oh, that's fascinating. And I suppose, you know, we have obviously rituals of baptism, which involve in, in some 
uh, faith's full immersion in water, yeah, don't they? Yeah, they definitely do. And so in terms of the story, I mean, do we know how old it is? Where does it come from? Um, it, well, it comes from, it seems there are two separate stories, really. Well, three, in a way. Okay. So the, um, the legend of the church bell dates from the 1530s, when the church was built, 1533. Sure. And that supposedly did happen, so there probably is a bell somewhere at the bottom of Rossomir. I'm not sure anyone's ever gone diving to find if it's actually there. How but, cool. um that supposedly did happen. Love that. And then the mermaid legend seems to be linked specifically with the Edgerton family who lived at Tatted Hall. Okay. Um, and I found the connection to Charlotte Edgerton, who's a real, she was a real person who has the memorial in the church. And I've connected the two. Oh, I see. Uh, so they weren't, they weren't actually connected. So that previous connection didn't exist, despite the fact that there was this prophecy and folktale? Uh, no. So <laughs> um, they just, um, all it says is that she, she, they thought she died in the mere the night before her wedding. Oh, wow. Um, but so then you... the, re- the records say bronchial infection. <laughs> okay, but you've drawn all that <laughs> yeah, together. Yeah, I thought I'd pull it together and just, I, I don't know, it seemed she was part of that family and the story was connected to that family, so it seemed too, too neat not to have oh, it. Oh, that's super interesting. And I wanted to run through the theme of the night before the wedding. Wow, thank bad happening. You, Eleanor. That was such a good story. I've just got to tell you, actually, at Rustan Mir, there is, I think it's on one of the banks or on a wall or something, there is a small carved stone figure which might represent a Celtic water god as well. Ooh. So I think the idea that there is some sort of genius loci connected with Rustan Mir is very old. And just to say genius loci, local god, spirit, basically. Spirit place. Spirit yeah. Of place, yeah. So maybe a Celtic water deity or something living under there that's oh. got kind of turned into the, the mermaid of Rustan Mir. That's so fascinating. Well, thank you very much. Should we talk correspondence? Yes, let's. Okay, so no new reviews this week, but please, dear listener, if you have a moment, then do please write us one on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or on your favourite podcatcher, because every review we get really does help other people to find the podcast. Speaking of which, looking at the analytics the oh, other day, yeah. which we did, pushing our glasses up our noses, mm-hmm. we learned that over 6,000 individual people downloaded Three Ravens during during the month of August, which is kind of a mind-boggling number to oh, us. It's pretty wild. Um, we're going to need a bigger garden. Yeah, we are. Now, thank you as ever to everyone who's sharing word of the podcast and telling your friends and posting about us on social media and so on. We are incredibly grateful and fully aware that the only reason the podcast is growing is because of you, our amazing Three Ravens community. Mm-hmm. Thank you for being so supportive and taking a few seconds here, a few minutes there, and spreading word of our dark mutterings across the land. (laughs) Thank you also to everyone who's written to us this week, including the lovely messages we had from Tony, Gary, Billy Joe, Ben and Sam. Oh yes, Sam sent us a great photo from her family day out at the Rollwright Stones, along with some super details that we will definitely be mentioning in our second listener episode, which, as mentioned, will be coming out in November. Please, if you have any local folklore to share with us or interesting folkloric or folk medicine anecdotes, do send them through to threeravenspodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to feature them. We would, we would. Now, as for our likers, commenters and super sharers this week, we need to say very special thank yous to October, Teddy, Maija, Charles, Sharon, Greg, Libby, Michelle, Alex and the Fairy Folk on Facebook, Stroud Story, Folky Flow, What the Folk, Rachel Creates, Saz, WW Brighton, hope I'm saying that okay, and Helen on Instagram, and Beverly, Mystic Moon, Teasel, Beth, Curious Ordinary, and Blopton on Twitter. If you haven't already, then do please come and join us as we gronk away on social media via facebook.com forward slash Three Ravens Podcast, Instagram at Three Ravens Podcast, and Twitter at Three Ravens Pod. And of course, if you would like exclusive and bonus content, then do consider joining our Patreon for three dollars a month or six dollars a month via patreon.com forward slash three ravens podcast. Yes, please do. And our new film club episode will be on Patreon on Thursday. We're going to be talking American Werewolf in London. Hello! Hello! <laughs> and Martin, where are we headed to next Monday for our Series 2 finale? We are headed to Yorkshire, home of Mother Shipton and so much interesting stuff. And I'm going to be telling a story based on a real-life witch trial involving fairies as recorded in 17th century court records. Oh, very exciting. Yeah. And 
And before then, we of course have our Something Wicked episode where Martin is going to be talking us through one of the most gruesome and strange folkloric crimes of the 19th century, the Red Barn Murders. In the meantime though, while our story's gone that way, we'll go this way. And remember, don't whistle till you're out of the woods. Thanks and credit go to the Visit Cheshire website, Cheshire Folk Tales by The Journeyman and Myths and Legends of Cheshire by Paula Mann. Our theme song is the traditional folk ballad Three Ravens, performed by Eleanor Conlon and Ben Harbour, and our logo was designed by Ollie James Dare. The Three Ravens podcast is a Rust and Stardust production, produced by me, Martin Vaux. Thanks for listening. God sent every gentleman, such hounds, such hawks, and such lean men, with a down, derry, 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 down, down.